to ask a question about social media. Um, I'm not seeing much traction on my social media, my Instagram, and I'm not seeing much traction to the website, maybe like three to five views a day. And it may go up to 10, like max. How would you advise to, how do I fix that or drive traffic to Instagram to my website? Sure. Um, well, what are you doing for your social media and Instagram right now? I take my own picture, photo pictures here in my studio and I edit them and then upload. I use a, a um, social media like hashtag generator. I use hashtags, I use captions and that's pretty much all I've been doing. Okay. Uh, and how often are you posting? Two times a day. Um, oh, wow. okay. I skip Saturday and Sunday. Got it. Um, what's your, I guess, area of expertise? What does your organization focus on? It's a spiritual lifestyle brand. So we focus on items that just feed your self-care and your spirit. So right now we just have meditation candles, sage and body butters, and we plan to expand into active wear and things like that down the road. Okay, cool. Well, um, you got a couple of good things going on for you already. One that you're posting quite consistency twice a day um, does take a lot of effort. So uh, it's great that you're already doing that. And then the second thing is that, um, you know, your focus is pretty niche, um, which is actually an advantage in social media compared to wanting to attract everybody. Um, I guess my next question is, are you, um, are you doing anything to engage with others on Instagram and social media? Are you going to other people's posts and commenting or providing feedback on anything? I haven't started doing that. The most I do is like polls to interact with my um, customer base. Like, oh, do you prefer this jar, this jar, what candle name? I had a competition where I gave away two free butters, um, things like that. But I should start commenting on my other people's posts as well. Yeah. So um, one thing, so it, it sounds like you're already doing a great job at one half of um, the, the job of Instagram, which is, you know, creating content for yourself. And I'm sure it looks great too. Um, but the second part of it that gets tends to get overlooked until you, until you really start to look into how to improve on social media is interacting with the community and people and posts that are, I guess, in a similar area as yours. So there's, um, there's a strategy that Val and I love to reference um, from a guy who's popular on social media and YouTube called Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, and he has a strategy called the $1.80 strategy. Literally just search dollar sign one period eight zero on Google. Uh, and we can link it in the chat too. And he basically breaks down how every single day you can um, interact with the people um, within certain hashtags and things like that to provide value to their posts and therefore attract people back into your own. Um, so I highly recommend looking into that. I have a good feeling that that will help you out. Um, but Val, do you have anything else to add on to that? I guess, I guess my question would be like, what, who's your, who's your target audience? Like who would you define as the, like the main one advocate of your business and maybe two is like actually purchaser because sometimes those are two different things my target audience is spiritually grounded people between the age of 25 and 55 okay. the brand is really focused on people who are still in the phase of their life where they want things where they want to evolve and change <clears throat> and so we're just focused on spiritually driven people that want to give back and invest in lower income communities because there's also a charity nonprofit aspect of it um is that niche enough? Like, what would you think? You know, that, that's definitely, that's definitely niche. I mean, it's, it's good that you can, you can define uh, your audience. I think a couple of things you want to look a little bit more into is that when, when you notice that traction might not be growing at the pace that you want it to go. I can't believe that. I am not that. Mute. <laughs> uh, probably mute. Um, just wait a second. There you go. Um, so when you are uh, looking at like data and let's say that you're, you're noticing over time, uh, you, you want to look at your trends of like how fast it's growing. It's okay that if sometimes things are not going very fast, you have to always look at it on a week to week schedule. So my recommendation is put on a spreadsheet. I'm not going to lie. It's the easiest way to have a very objective viewpoint of what's happening with your data. It's called KPIs, your key performance indicators. Like how are you validating what mediums are working, how they're working. And just kind of every week, just write like, number of like 
is your engagement percentage growing? Is your follower count growing? Just have like a very objective way of looking at it. And then the questions that you want to ask yourself uh, in that process is, am I reaching my audience in the medium where they are engaging with my business the most? And the reason why I'm bringing that up is like the type of business you have, I would even see like TikTok actually might be even more valuable because if you're showing tangible things like a candle, um, there's ways to show that in a video format a lot powerful than like a photo, for example. So maybe the medium of how you're showing it in a uh, photo or like a static way is not engaging enough for that audience base that you're targeting. And by you doing these KPIs, now you can test, you can experiment, you can then try a little bit of TikTok, a little bit of video style, or if you don't want to go to TikTok yet, you want to stay on Instagram, you can do Instagram reels, but the alter alternation of the content is a lot in, like a, a very important part of, of, of your marketing strategy uh, because there's no such thing as a perfect marketing strategy. It's all about A-B testing and having a way to track that data and seeing what works based off the audience and what you're um, targeting. There you go. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and based off of that, you can keep expanding on, on that strategy by just experiencing and see what works. And once you see that there is an uptick and you do it a couple of times, now you start really reinforcing down that, that, that like, okay, this is the content that's really engaging. It's working on this angle uh, because you're doing the, the parts that are the hardest, like the consistency is very hard for people to do uh, and, and, and managing that part. So if you already have that part down, now it's more about the experimentation of the content. What mediums are you actually engaging with that audience with and what is creating that uh, reaction that you're expecting? And then the other part that Nikhil talked about by engaging with other social platforms or other social accounts, it actually now increases the amount of individuals that have awareness about your business as well, if you do it in a very uh, authentic way, uh, by giving your thoughts on ideas that fit into your space. And the reason why, I mean, social media is intended to be social, that's why it's called social media. And, and I, ironically, even when I do social media, I tend to not be as social as I should be. Uh, but that's the reality is the more social you are with others, the more likeliness is that they're going to engage with you as well. Uh, so that, that's the couple, couple of balances I would play around with. And then as for how does that drive to your website? I mean, there's a lot of things that can drive website growth, everything from your SEO, your organic growth, your, the way you go about blog writing, content writing, driving from social to the website. I think step one for you on social is not necessarily looking at how does that transcribe to your website traffic. I would focus on how does, how do you drive your engagement level on social media? Okay. Um, because the main thing for social media is not the amount of followers you have that matters. It matters how many of those followers are actually engaging with you. You could have a hundred followers and all hundred people like are actually paying attention. That's a lot better for your business than having a thousand people. And it's like 50 people here and there that actually care about what you're doing because it's going to be disconnected. So the messaging you're trying to get across is not going to actually resonate with them. Um, so those are the couple of steps I would recommend kind of just looking at what, what you're doing right now. And then, and then having an objective way of like, this is the content that I'm doing, what's actually hitting home, what's not, and then building off of that. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Carolina, you have a question? You are on mute still. So there, Hi. There. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having this. Um, so my question was, you said something about like reviewing our website, like being able to go over our site and give some kind of insight. We are, mm -hmm. um, we're a nonprofit, a recovery community organization in Riverside County. And um, the same thing as the lady before us of the, you know, and, and I, I heard it, right? We don't have engagement. Um, our like target population is RCOs are really new in the space of California. Uh, we are peer led, peer ran, community based recovery, you know, after treatment kind of um, deal. And so it's like a big broad audience. Um, and, and it's kind of been a challenge to hone in on because they're so diverse, the different target populations, how do you really bring that together across one platform when they're so diverse? Uh, and and I, I mean by, by indigenous communities, the reentry population, bilingual, multiple pathways of recovery, um, and just being a recovery community organization for um, substance use and mental health challenges. Got it. Got it. Uh, do you have uh, the URL of your website? We can we can bring it up and give you some it's feedback. It's at um, thehappierlifeproject.org. Okay. Hey. Okay. Got it. 
Uh, Nikhil, do you want to uh, go through it first? I can then give my thoughts on it right after. Yep, just bringing it up right now. Okay. So you've got about 12 services. Okay, cool. Um, do you want to do you have any thoughts so far should i go through some other pages uh you're on mute yeah i can give some quick thoughts for the kind of right off the bat so um one of the one of the main things uh, for almost every website uh, is the the attention span attention span of somebody who goes to your website is roughly about six to ten seconds uh, right when they go on your website. So if they do not understand exactly what your organization does right off the bat, uh, they're most likely going to leave. And it doesn't even matter like who you're messaging to, who your audience is. If it's not very evident and clear exactly what your organization does right when you go on a website or why I should care about this, um, there's a disconnect immediately. And you're gonna have a massive drop off. Like even if you had traffic going to the site, uh, they might feel lost. So uh, right, right away when I go onto the site, the only thing I see is uh, recovery your way. Um, that's it because the text that you have underneath that is hidden underneath that, that video you have. Uh, and what's happening there is I have actually no idea what your organization does. And if I was going through Google search, for example, and I was going through a bunch of different uh, websites, um, I would probably just see this and jump out and go to the next website. That's a very natural reaction that, that consumers have. So you have to always think, keep in mind of making sure that there's a statement or something that makes it like evidently clear what this organization does right off the bat um, and kind of builds off into it and, and, and really tells it in a story of thinking of someone who's never engaged with your organization before and, and like bringing them into this is everything we do because right now like it, it's uh recover your way there's an image then there's the the paragraph text and that paragraph text uh is is getting into some of the nitty-gritty of it but i think you can probably take this and make it into like one core statement that is recover your way with like one statement that this organization is doing um talking a little bit about what the um this organization does, and then maybe even already talking about some impact or some social proof or some like testimonial videos or something that really engages that point of what this organization does before all these services, because going through this, the services might feel overwhelming, exactly where you're kind of talking about. There's a lot of th things that are going on here. Uh, and, and for me, that, that can overwhelm uh, very quickly uh, because there's so many items and I have no context to what audience is these items for? So even if I was on like, if I'm a donor, I'm not too sure of exactly what the impact is. And then if I'm a consumer, I'm, I'm overwhelmed of what, what actually I'm trying to go find on this website from the, the, the homepage. Um, but that, that's like my quick thoughts. And that's a lot, just small okay. organizations and how the messaging is coming across. And then uh, all the way up to the top, Nikhil, if you scroll up, um, there's a lot of menu items, like a lot. So <laughs> that's the other part is that this can easily, once again, overwhelm uh, an audience because if they go to your website, it's a lot better to be like five menu items, for example, and then having secondary drop downs from them versus having a lot of items on there because this is very hard for me to understand where I want to go. And like I said, people make decisions, attention spans getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So if it takes me longer and longer to find that information, I'm gonna, I might just get frustrated and leave uh, yeah. from the site right off the bat. So those are a couple of my really quick comments, but Nikhil, you can go a little bit more into like some of the, the UX ideas and, and, and the structure of that. Um, that was quite a bit. I want to see if Carolina has any thoughts before. No, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely agree because that's been kind of my gripe 
right? It's like, I want simple placeholders where you click like three and then that goes into depth, right? For one. And then the tagline kind of thing, like it says, Okay, recovery your way. Like we had something where it was like um, building community, enhancing recovery, creating a happier life. Um, I don't know, you know, I guess coming up with something better, but like removing the picture. I, I thank you for what you shared because there's a lot of menu tabs up at the top that aren't even supposed to be there right now that I'm looking at them. They're supposed to be somewhere else in the about us page. So I don't know why he put them there. Um, but specifically because I'm paying for this and it's been like a process that I'm like, why haven't we nailed this yet? Um, and it kind of feels like a waste of money, honestly, um, uh, right now, really. Um, so thank you. I don't know if there's other things that you can share. Uh, well, so Val said, mentioned, um, a lot of the main points from the homepage, but I do quickly want to check what this looks like on mobile. Um, because that's also a key factor here. Most, uh, about half of your traffic will be on mobile. Um, and right off the bat, building off of Val's points about like the scrolling and stuff, if you could move the donate and the menu, the hamburger menu icon kind of in the same like plane, like next to each other, rather than on top of each other, that'll instantly reduce the amount of space taken up. Um, same with the social icons. Um, but overall, it seems to be organized pretty decently. I actually don't see the services anymore. Or are they? Oh, okay. So they're organized now. Um, you know, interestingly, I feel like this works a little bit better um, than what was on desktop. It's not as overwhelming um, because it's like categorized into three, um, three categories. Um, but it overall, it seems to be fairly mobile optimized. There's always room for improvement, of course. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Val really hit most of the important points there. And, um, you know, we're, we're definitely happy to talk more about, uh, how you can improve your website later on. Um, so feel okay. free to like reach out if you have any questions. Um, yeah, and definitely can set up some time and talk well, about it more. Well, we receive a recording of this. I know I noticed your recording. Will we get this back? Yeah. yeah. Um, after the session, uh, you'll receive a follow-up email from, from us, and yeah. um, it'll have the recording. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, quick question that was in the, the chat from Regina. Uh, do you recommend posting TikTok videos on YouTube? I would not recommend posting TikTok on YouTube. Uh, okay, go ahead, Nico. You have always something <laughs> to throw in there. YouTube, YouTube has a thing called YouTube Shorts. So yes, I, I haven't seen that on the on the desktop version of YouTube, but on the app, it's just like TikTok and it's very addicting. I have deleted my YouTube app because of how addicting it is, just like TikTok. But yeah, I think you can repurpose those TikTok videos on YouTube shorts, but not like regular YouTube. But sorry, go ahead, Val. Yeah, no, I, I was going to say, I, I didn't even realize that YouTube actually came out with that yet. Um, but yeah, what you do on TikTok, you can post on TikTok, Instagram Reels, and then uh, YouTube shorts because it's short form content. The other way is like if you do a long format video, because YouTube as a core is intended for long formats, so like three minutes plus. Uh, and those can be the other way. So you can take a YouTube video and then clip that into something that might be an Instagram reels post or a TikTok post and just shorten that video. It's a lot easier to take a longer video and make it shorter than take a short video and then try to post it in different places. So uh, that'd be my recommendation there. That being said, if you ever do have a TikTok video that goes viral, then go ahead and post that on YouTube and post it everywhere because at that point, you know, it's going to engage uh, and it'll work. But rarely does that happen because people that go on YouTube expect long format uh, and TikTok audience is looking for quick 90 seconds uh, of attention span. So it's a very different type of content that engages uh, those, those audiences. Um, so the next question we have here uh, is from Sarah. Uh, so Sarah, do you have a question? Hi, yes. Um, so I operate an apparel company that has a large social responsibility aspect to it. Um, think something similar to like a Patagonia. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you have other examples other than Patagonia of great storytelling and about us sections through social media that connects back to the website. 
Um, All Birds is a great example, personally, that I think uh, really tells the story of sustainability. I mean, All Birds, of course, has massive in infrastructure now, so <laughs> they, they're able to do that. Um, but the, the essence, and I followed All Birds very, very, very early on of how they were able to build into what they are today. Um, and it's, it's very focused on like the, the rest of the website is very e-commerce based. Um, but the, the way that they go about, um, talking about sustainability and all their different initiatives and, and building on, uh, their story is, is quite unique, but they've kind of shifted away from that because they no longer have to be so heavy storytelling. Now they can just be very focused on e-commerce and that's the natural evolution of, uh, a mission-driven organization once you get to a certain point is that you don't have to overemphasize the, the, the impact part. You can focus more on the e-commerce aspect of it. Um, that, that's like a quick idea that I have. It's more about the, like, the story behind the, the bringing in of all birds and, and, and the push against the odds that is interesting to me for that. Um, Nikhil, do you have any other like really quick ideas on your end of something that, that is a good uh, showcase of Sustainability. Um, I would. I can. I can probably pull up. Like we can find a bunch of examples and send them afterwards. I'm. I'm just trying to like think off the top of my head. Um, what comes? To yeah, mind. I've definitely seen websites, and as a web designer, I have like a whole archive of sites that I go to for inspiration. But none of the names are coming to my head right now. So we'll definitely send them. However, this isn't necessarily this example that I'm about to give isn't like necessarily the best in storytelling or the best for sustainability. However. I just found them yesterday and I'm most likely about to buy their product because their website copy very much made me realize like this would be the right shoe for me, right? So um, it's called Kuru Footwear, K-U-R-U -U Footwear. Um, I'll type it into. Um, and like, basically as somebody with like flat feet, I haven't been able to like, it's painful to wear shoes sometimes. And so I'm trying to find something that like really works. And this was one of those websites that was like telling me about their technology, telling me about how they're also sustainable and how they give back um, and how this is going to be the right shoe for me. So um, I definitely recommend checking them out, but of course we will send some more links um, uh, in, in, in the future to help you out there. Yeah. And, and I was just going to add real quickly is that in, in general for storytelling, uh, I mean, these are great for sustainability. We'll send you kind of a portfolio of uh, examples to look at for mission driven and sustainable side, but just in general for storytelling, uh, my recommendation for any website that you want to tell a story about is make sure the story is, is clearly articulated through it. Um, but the story does not overshadow the, point of the impact that you're trying to provide. And the reason why I'm saying the, the balance between the two is that if it's too heavy on storytelling, um, you, you might not be able to actually sell your apparel uh, and vice versa. Obviously, if it's too heavy on apparel, you're not telling your story at all. So it's all about, um, and this will come when you look at the, the portfolio, it's all about straight to the point of like what this impact, like why is the apparel or what you're doing so important and so great? And then how do you build off of there into why the story then ties into why you are the, the, the company to provide that impact, if that makes sense. I, I don't know if that, that's clear, but that, that's generally for storytelling, what you want to make sure that there's a nice balance between the objective of the website and then how the story uh, amplifies that objective versus it being too heavy on the storytelling part. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just added a couple of links um, to some sites that I just remembered. One is for, <laughs> they both happen to be like for plant-based food, um, but their storytelling, like I remember their names because of how good um, the storytelling was on their websites. Do you specifically have experience with Shopify and any apps or plugins that allow their blogs to work better? <laughs> yeah, Shopify blogs are uh, kind of a pain, uh, not going to lie. Um, there, uh, there's a couple I can recommend for you uh, that you can build into a little bit cleaner uh, on Shopify for blogs. Um, generally, what we do if we're going to play around with Shopify is we actually build our websites on Webflow first 
and only the back end is done through Shopify. Shopify is great for the e-commerce functionality of a website, but it's 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 very custom coding for any UI or like the visual side of it. Um, so that's kind of the, the pro and a con of Shopify that it does kind of require development to be very clean, but I can send some plugins on no code ways to add like a blog page and how to organize it and make it very clean. Uh, but there are still some limitations to it, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll send some over after this, this, uh, this meeting. Um, hi, it's me again. If no one else had any questions, I want to know if you would um, mind giving me any first th thoughts about my website. If you, it's called um, bornreal.com, B-O-R-N with an E. I put it in the chat. Yeah, I just pulled it up. Let me share my screen again. All right. So far, very clean and organized. Um, I can see it's a Shopify website. That's cool. Um, great. So yeah, the checkout process is seamless, as you would expect with the Shopify website. So that's good. Um, I don't think there are any concerns about usability here. I guess it's more about, as we've been talking about, uh, the storytelling and um, I guess a little bit more about your products and candles. Because okay. um, right now it's just helping you find your way to get back, helping you find your way back to you um, and a quote by Rumi and then into the products. I really don't know right now anything about the candles okay um or why i should buy them okay um so i would consider adding a little bit more on the home page um about that and you might have that like on the product pages but i just haven't seen it yet okay and it seems like you do a little bit um and then if you go into the brand mission there isn't anything yet oh oh okay so there's like one line um so definitely I would recommend adding a little bit more context and substance in, um, you could turn this into a page about born real rather than just a page about the brand mission and put the brand mission in that about page essentially. Um, Val, you got any more thoughts to add on? I think the main thing looking at the site is just, yeah, it's just uh, giving, giving some more, more impact to the messaging and really like that's what I was saying the balance between uh storytelling and an e-commerce e uh website this is actually a great example of like this is so heavy on more of the e-commerce not so much on the storytelling and it and especially if you're really engaging with your audience on social media and really kind of building on this community you need to make sure that that community feels consistent on what message you're putting out there on the website as well uh, and really welcoming them in, uh, joining them in. And then, yeah, as for the products, when Nikhil was talking about giving more context to the products uh, uh, and, and why they matter tied into this idea of uh, helping you find your way back to you. Um, I think you can definitely play on that. It's all about now building that, that story and how the products tie into that. And everything kind of fits that mold of that, um, that articulation of why this, why this organization exists in the first place. Um, I think that's important. And I know there's limitations once again through Shopify. There's things that are easy to add on there. There's things that are really hard to add on there. Um, so it's a, it's a balancing act of what is actually feasible. Uh, but as much as you can add for products, it also does help for SEO because uh, the way that Google is gonna be pulling uh, from your products. And Nikhil, can you click on a product, please? Just like click on one. Okay, uh, scroll down. Uh, I'm sorry, I realized I called them candles. Um, I, I apologize, they're not candles. No, it's candles and butters. I think you saw candles. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's both. Um, so there, there's a pretty good description uh, on, the, on the top part, uh, but don't be afraid to even give more details about it. Uh, talk a little bit more about um, what ingredients are being used. All these things add a lot more layers of SEO. That adds value to your visibility online uh, for this, this e-commerce store. 
Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, Holly, you have a question? Yes. Um, here's my website. Um, in a while. I don't have video. Um, I know you've looked at it. I've changed it up a little bit. Um, it still needs a ton of work, but I wondered if you could just give a quick look at it. Mm -hmm. Let me check out the mobile. Got it. Cool. Um, so I, I guess my recommendations would tie into more of the organization and the layout of the website. Um, okay. So at the top here, um, I would recommend when, when people read anything, at least in America and most Western countries, it's from left to right. And if you look a little bit more into website usability and stuff, you'll notice that there are certain reading patterns, um, either in F shape, so like kind of like down and then to the right, or like a Z okay. shape, like a zigzag kind of thing. Um, okay. So considering that, I would recommend swapping the placement of the picture and the text. So put the text either in the center or on the left side, and you can put this picture um, either to the right or you can, yeah, I, I would put it to the right. Um, and this picture of the girl over here, I would probably put that next to something else that it might be related to. Um, okay. And for the message from the founder, um, one way to bring more life to the site is to actually put a picture of yourself. Um, and okay. bring some personality that so that people, when they see this, uh, they'll instantly start to trust you a little bit because they know what you look like and you're not, um, you know, you're not hidden behind anything. Um, okay. So that, and then I would also, before even getting into the message from you, I would talk a little bit more about what Academic Solutions USA is more than just training teachers and developing student talent to, again, tell more of a story um, about what you all do. Um, yeah, and then in for About Us, that was the other page I clicked into. Um, I would also recommend talking a little bit more about the organization before you get into each of the individuals. Um, but that's my two cents there, Val, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, those are those are great comments, obviously, more on the, the web design side. So I'll just give my comments more on the SEO uh, side or like the, the added value once design is kind of there um, is right off the bat here. Um, the way that this is structured is not Google is going to have a hard time understanding what the information on this website is, uh, because the way that Google does read site indexes is left to right the same way that a human reads it uh, and they go left to right straight down um, and they're looking for uh, what is the purpose of your site right off the bat so um, they want to see that you're uh, talking about so for example if you want to rank for academic solutions um, obviously if someone types in your entire business name they might be able to find you right away off google but if they're looking for academic solutions for example Right now, you actually are the, the second ranking uh, terminology. But if I'm trying to search for empowering gifted learners, that's where there's a gap in how easy it is to find your organization. And that's the ultimate purpose of your organization. Um, so right now with the way that this homepage is structured, 
uh, is not allowing you to start ranking for that uh, because it is not that that phrase of empowering gifted learners is not discussed uh, in your um, first H1. So H1 is the title, like where you say training teachers and developing student talent. Um, uh-huh. That's that's called your H1. That's your main title of the web page. So my recommendation okay. here is, is actually you should use the empowering uh, or empowering undeserved gifted learners, un- uh, underserved uh, gifted learners. And then right underneath that, you can put another line that says training teachers and developing student talent or something to reinforce both. But you want to make sure that the empowering uh, underserved, because uh, Nikhil, can you check if that's an image, like the whole thing's an image for the logo? This? Yeah. Like, yeah, what, is that empowering as well? Uh, I can't highlight it. Too. Okay, so there's no way that Google knows what that text is. So Google actually doesn't know that your organization is called Academic Solutions, and it doesn't even know that tagline because it's an image. It can't read that image text. So it's very important that as you're starting your website based off your organization, that you're bringing up uh, your tag, like your focus of empowering uh, underserved gifted learners. Uh, and then uh-huh. make you sure to use that a couple times throughout the messaging uh, on your homepage to really reinforce that point. Cause it's now telling Google that that is what your organization does. And that's what I want it to rank for uh, as, as you're going through the website. Um, and then Nikhil, if you scroll further down, um, same thing here when it comes to Google is it's going to try to understand what each of these sections are, but Google is still going to be reading left to right. So Google might have a hard time understanding uh, how you organize these sections because it's going to understand it as the section you had above, and then it's going to go in its in Google's head. It's going to finding gifted, uh, finding uh, hidden gifts directly tied into that paragraph you had above, and it's going to not really understand what the uh, messaging you have underneath it is. So there's in general, when you're trying to make sure that your web page is one easy for users to read, but also for Google to read, um, you want to think it as if I'm reading left to right, and I'm just purely leading left to right as I'm going through the page. Does this make sense? Um, and is it reinforcing the the uh, terminology I want people to find me for? Uh, and if not, then it requires very basic restructuring of that content to make sure that Google can easily read it. Um, that would be my recommendation here. It's just, it's just small movements and making sure that the t- core terminology you want individuals to find your uh, uh, website for can easily find it if I go on Google. Um, that, that would be my recommendation here. Um, but I think it just requires the structure change first and then the messaging to be adjusted thereafter uh, based off what Nikhil brought up. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Looks like we have another website in the chat. So let me bring it up. All right, this is Locale. Yeah, it's basically locally. Um, and basically it's a play on really trying to um, have a one-stop shop source for um, resort communities initially, um, and then going global as far as, um, you know, targeting small business restaurant based in as much as possible in real time. And that's what I'm looking at right now. We developed this site basically just on Wix with the tools that were provided. And if you hit like one of the round buttons, it has like curated spots, a little bit about, um, you know, the different restaurants that are favorite and then direct links um, that will take them, you know, either right to their site or to reservations um, and all that. So it looks actually a little bit better on uh, mobile uh, versus the desktop. It looks, I think, a little bit cleaner, but I still feel it does look a little busy still. Is this what it's supposed to look like on mobile? Oh, no, no, it doesn't look like that on, on my phone. Okay, yeah, no, probably not pulling sure. it up directly. Yeah, you might have to look at it just on the on the desktop for now. Yeah. Okay. So the concept is in, in the, the Instagram moments are basically, uh, you know, as close to real time as possible. Ultimately, uh, we want to be 
available and known for, and this is where I'm running into trouble right now in the actual programming end, is I want to take the minutia out of when you do a Google search, say you're in a new city or town like Palm Springs, you're standing on the corner, you want to go to a restaurant, how many hours and pages do you go through kind of scrolling through to get the most updated information, what's going on, um, what kind of traffic they have. So we ultimately want this to be in as much real time as possible, um, either linking directly with the, um, the restaurants, bars, clubs, um, small businesses, and uh, you know, deliver within a couple of clicks, um, within a few blocks, content that's you know what they're looking, what someone is looking for if they're looking for a restaurant, versus getting hit with all of the when you go to Google, you, the first ten or fifteen um, restaurants or things that will come up are all going to be paid advertised space. Got it. Um, if I I feel like. SEO sounds like a very important key piece here. So yep. Val, I, do you want me to navigate to a certain page if you have any questions or do you have any thoughts so far? I'm just trying to think of how Google would query this. Yeah. Um, because there's certain functions in here that I think would be very hard for Google to understand all the information that is being passed through the site. Um, mm -hmm. can you go to, can you just go to a page, Nico? Like I'll just click on one of them. Okay. Okay. So, uh, right off the bat, what I'm noticing for this structure is what I was talking about earlier, where Google's going to read left to right. So even one small change that I would do on this page is I would left align the first text box and then right or like swap those. So it reads the text first. So it's re-emphasizing the point of that. Um, but even, even here, I think it needs to have some context to like, when I, we, we just clicked on, I think the, what was it? Play was whatever, whatever the icon was. You need to have like a paragraph first that reinforces, like have the title of what that page was and then have, so it's like hotspots, uh, right? And then have a paragraph that defines what are you gonna find on this page? Define what hotspots are. And then it goes into the next part. And then the one thing I'm noticing about how you're organizing the image versus a uh, button versus text, I would make your call to action like the tram now, uh, tramway now, that should be underneath your text because now it's a button before the text. Google is going to not understand what the text is and why you have a call to action button there. So it's about swapping those. Um, and then the text looks pretty good. Uh, and then when you click on it, does it go to another site? Or is it stay on the site? Yeah, yeah. It'll go to a, it'll go to another site. Got it. Okay. Uh, can you go back, Nikhil? So it kind of it, it's kind of curating different sites that are currently available, um, and kind of pulling in the content. We've mm -hmm. been playing around with structure and just looking at it. again. I think the problem we're trying to solve is. When you, when you go on a vacation or you go somewhere new, you know, you're spending all this time trying to research a city and pull through and you're going through like tens and tens of thousands of pages. And I guess the average person right now, there's, I, I think the last data I read said something about three to six hours of browsing time for an average person researching a vacation or a new spot and really not coming up with anything concrete. I really like that stat, Nikki. Go to the homepage. I have a recommendation. Exactly what you brought up. That should be the first thing you say here. <laughs> so um, right, right now when I go to this page, uh, I, I see what uh, locally is. I see what you're kind of trying to build on, but I still don't know why I care about this. Like right off the bat, I have no idea why I should be on this site. Why I should click on anything. Why I should navigate to anything. Um, and what you just stated to me is exactly why I would I should be on here, where when you do okay. the messaging for a website, make sure you're talking to the problem of your audience and reinforcing of what do they have as an issue today? And what is the, um, what is the ultimate, where are they trying to go? And then how your organization bridges that gap. If you can articulate that, it's going to entice somebody to want to engage with it. Um, and then the other recommendation I have is right now, uh, you have like now in Palm Springs, but there's nothing to tell me I should be clicking on those, those bubbles or like the ideas you have. There's nothing to like, say like choose 
what is now in Palm Springs or something like something to make me want to select uh, an, uh, an action before I then go to that web page. Uh, and then when you go to those web pages, my recommendation, yeah, just structure it a little bit based off SEO principles. So there's a little bit paragraph talking about golf, like what is golf in Palm Springs like, and then give the options of golf uh, in Palm Springs to kind of reinforce that SEO point. And then okay. the last comment I have is Nikhil, if you click on one of them again, uh, and this is more of an accessibility thing. I do think that the text you have right now is too small of font size. Um, it's very hard to read, uh, especially uh, with a lot of accessibility rules. Um, yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, 12 point font, which is not awful, but I would use bigger font because um, especially let's say if your target audience does range above the age of 50, uh, accessibility here is going to become a, become a problem if your font is under like 16. Uh, so you want to reorganize that a little bit just to make sure it's a little yeah, bit. Yeah. And, and, and again, when you pull it up on your phone, that completely changes. It mm -hmm. is larger yeah. and it comes structured and it's layered um, completely different. Um, so I was able to manipulate it a little bit with uh, using Wix mobile, which can be re really a lot of flexibility in redesigning the mobile site. Um, mm -hmm. And because we do feel that about 95% of the people that are using this site are going to be on their mobile. And yep. then the we're sort of a two two layer. Um, I mean, we hit the consumer, but we also are targeting small business with some marketing services um, and various things that we can provide, um, you know, as well as some other information. So, I, I think that was the other conflict we've had is you know targeting towards what the consumer is looking at versus what the um, you know as a business owner because we want to provide direct links for a business to upload social media content directly into our feeds with one click and then hit both their Instagrams, Facebook, um, and multiple sites at once. So that's kind of the secondary piece of it. But thanks for the feedback. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, absolutely. H happy to give any other insights as you go far. Just feel free to shoot us just a quick message if there's any questions. Um, but yeah, I just think some of those small changes are going to really create a little bit more impact and make it more clear of, as to what is this burning need and why I should be on here? Because that's going to then drive more people when they send like a quick link to a friend. This is what you should check out. They also understand that you don't have to have them do the communication on your behalf. They can then just send it over and the website speaks for itself and they understand why that matters to the audience who goes in the site. Right. Ultimately, we want locally to become the you know, de facto standard. If they want to know anything about a city, go to locally and you know, pull down and we'll have it all structured. So literally any city, you know, globally, technically. Mm -hmm. But now one the challenge is, is pulling that content in because right now it's a very manual process. So it's writing the, um, you know, the logarithms to kind of pull that stuff in to at least start, gets the process started and then creating a consistent format. Absolutely. But yeah, if, if once you can figure out how to audio populate with like blog posts, like post format, that's dynamic. And that's actually gonna allow you to categorize and scale it. That's my recommendation for next stage is right now it's on Wix, but I would use a CMS platform. I would use WordPress, Webflow, um, something where you can actually uh, organize posts and then instead of them being like text like you have here, they should be like blog posts, blog post style. So then you can categorize them. And then when you create your okay. article, you just put all the information it's SEO optimized in one template. You can categorize them into what fill in is. Then you can actually have your community members or other people submit posts and you can review and accept. And now it becomes from a manual process to a uh, verification process, which is going to save you a lot of time in the future. Great, thank you. Yep, absolutely. Uh, the next site here, Nikhil, um, here, let me throw it into, send it to you, um, is the Foothill AIDS Project. So here, you can open that up, Nikhil. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. Um, so yeah, Nikhil, you, you can get started on this. I'll, I'll give my comments right after. So far, I like how clean and organized it is. Great use of colors in the right places. Nothing's overwhelming and everything's easy to read. So that's awesome. Um, I would recommend, Val had made a point earlier about Google not like needs to know the name of your organization. Um, you might want to spell out Foothill AIDS Project um, it looks like you've done it here, but maybe somewhere up here as well um, in the in the hero. Um, 
but so far good job of like explaining what the AIDS project does, what you're about. Um, let's see, let's go to some other pages. Yeah, I've got to say so far it's quite well done. Um, let's see here. Okay, so this goes to an external website. Um, let's go into about us. Val, you got any comments so far? Um, so I, I think overall structure is great. Uh, this also is great for SEO optimization. If you do go to the homepage, um, so one of my comments when it does come to like the, the hero and like using a full name instead of an acronym, it really just depends on how competitive your landscape is or how many organizations are very similar messaging. Uh, Cause you don't want Google to uh, rank somebody for the words you want to be found for first. However, in this case, I, I did double check on uh, Google uh, and, and this organization does come up first if you type in anything with Foothills Age Project. So the FAP doesn't really matter too much. However, I do, I do think it matters not for SEO, but for messaging, uh, because you don't introduce the idea of FAP until you go one scroll down uh, into the our uh, supporting services. That's the first time you actually explain us the acronym, even though it's very evident. Uh, you don't want to introduce any uh, consistency until you've introduced, introduced that in. Um, is one of my recommendations, uh, but it's a very, very minor thing. I think for the structure here, it's, it's great. It really walks through the story um, as, as you go further down with it. My only recommendation, if you go a little bit further, uh, what clients are saying. So right now you're saying what clients are saying, um, but I would want to know a little bit more about the impact. So for example, how many clients have you worked with over time? Is there any quantitative data that can be provided? Um, adding a little bit more here, I do think is impactful, but it's a very minor thing because I do think that this is already a great start on social, social proof. But for me, I'm, I'm looking at it as like, there's only three here. Uh, so I actually don't know how big the community size is. I don't know how much impact this organization has done fully. Um, so you could clarify that in this section by giving a little bit more context with quantitative data, if that data is accessible. Uh, cause I know that's not always, uh, accessible on that front. Uh, and then Nikki, if you scroll further down, just want to see something inquire today. There's a really good footer. SEO optimized on the footer end as well. Um, yeah, no, I, I think overall this is, this is great. I did a, a quick SEO audit the, uh, here, let's see. So as for like the SEO on the website, uh, just checking it, there is right now your score is roughly a 70% on on-page SEO, uh, meaning that there is a couple pages. Uh, so if you go to services, Nikhil, I'm, I'll give some quick comments there. So go mm -hmm. to service and then click on, uh, just click on one of the service options. Oh, it's on the same page. Got it. Okay. Um, so one recommendation here, if you want to build <laughs> on your SEO or like how, how much organizations are going to be finding based off these independent services you're doing, I would make yeah. them a separate page. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. That's the a, way we had it before. Mm. In a separate page. And then we, it was recommended then to put it like that. So what is the difference between having in a separate page or not? Yeah, so I it depends on how much information is available. So if you only have that much of a paragraph, it's fine to have it on the same page because it's digestible information, it's fine. However, that's a limited amount of information. So you're not going to be ranking on Google uh, for that amount of content for that specific service you're doing. So um, the way to think about it is see see in the URL right now uh, that Nikhil has up in the the top left corner he has your URL backslash services backslash hashtag let us connect you to HIV care. 
the thing is it's H it's hashtag because it's a, it's called an anchor. So it's only going to the same section within that page. Google's not reading your anchor. It doesn't care about your anchor. What Google does care about is let's say this was a separate page about let us connect you to HIV services. It would then read that you're, that is the, what you are actually talking about. And if you write a web page that has about 350 words talking about this information, Google's going to say, okay, if I am an individual on Google looking to connect to HIV care, and I'm in the geographic location of Foothills, because the rest of your website talks about that, I'm going to be able to find your website. So that's the difference on the SEO value of having a separate page. That being said, it does require more information. So unless you have more to talk about for that uh, content, um, I wouldn't make another page, but I'm just saying that's that's how you can add some more SEO value to this website by expanding on the services. You can still have this page as the overview page, but when I click on uh, information for one of those topics, it should go to a separate page where then I can learn a lot more about it and have testimonials just for that thing. Like you, you kind of build your own information for that, just that individual service. Google loves that. It wants you to become the Google of the information you're providing. That's at the end of the day, what Google will rank the highest. Oh, okay. And what about your opinion in, because we were discussing on, uh, also put it in the website, uh, the forms, you know, just to enroll. Those are the form, those are the, the um, requirements and people can print it from home, can read it, can get familiar, can call for questions. So what is your opinion about that? My recommendation is uh, one, you can add it here to this contact us page. You can add an information like download form and fill out form or whatever mm -hmm. you would want to have here on the contact page because it's a natural place that it can live. You can also add a frequently asked questions page. Um, talk a little bit about like FAQs that individuals might have about your organization. And then for a question that let's say it's like, uh, how do I enroll? that answer has like a hyperlink to a form that you can download and then fill out. So you can always do it in a way that's very natural, like an FAQ. Google also loves FAQ because Google's based off questions and answers. So by having a frequently asked questions section on the site, um, you can solve exactly by having this information you want to provide to your audience uh, and also getting some SEO value out of it. Okay, great. Great recommendation. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. I, I have a um, quick question. Okay. How often do you recommend posting on YouTube and TikTok? TikTok very frequently uh, because TikTok is based off of um, TikTok heavily is going to random audiences on an algorithm and the algorithm likes that there's consistent posting schedules. So the one thing with uh, TikTok is like the posting schedule on Instagram, if you did that on TikTok, you actually probably would get a pretty fast community because it's all about that consistency and the posting schedule to post a day on TikTok is massive. Uh -huh. uh, and the one thing that's really cool about TikTok is let's say that you've posted 50 videos or like 40 videos, you can start reposting your old ones again. Nobody knows it because it's a completely random audience that's getting to the algorithm. So you can regurgitate content and keep posting that out. That's what a lot of big TikTok channels do. Uh, and then just like tying into some of the trends and all that. YouTube, since it's long format, it's okay to post like once a month, once every two weeks. It does not have to be a crazy amount of posting. The algorithm is not going to reward you off of heavy consistency. YouTube's all about the quality of the content. Uh, that's how YouTube does their algorithm. TikTok's all about uh, engagement. So make sure that the first like 10 seconds of your TikTok video pulls me in. Uh, because if somebody watches your TikTok video for 15 seconds, it then counts as a, like a view in their algorithm, which then passes it through to another audience group. They kind of do like these sample buckets of like who might like your content. They test if it actually hits them and then it hits a bigger bubble and a bigger bubble and a bigger bubble to engage with that content piece. Perfect. Thank you. And, um, one more question, um, <clears throat> is, um, my KPI for my website is email signups. However, because I don't get a lot of traffic right now, do you think that that's a good KPI or should I change it? Or what do, what do you recommend? Yep, that's actually a great question. Everybody on this call, if you want to do something called KPIs, key performance indicators to really understand what's happening in your business, they have to be something that you individually can make adjustments in your strategy to impact every week. Meaning that if that's not a KPI, you can actually create impact for within a week. It's not a good KPI. Email signups, that's a great KPI because let's say that you had zero signups, 
you doing small efforts can get you one or two or three or four. And you can then calculate what efforts dro drove the action that you're trying to do. And then from the email signups, that actually allows you for a step one of building a community, which you can then drive into sales in the future. So that's actually, I would say that's one of the best um, KPIs you can have for uh, a e-commerce site is getting people into a newsletter because it's shown that those that sign up to a newsletter are, are more probable to buy uh, in the future as well. Awesome. And my last question is how often should you email? When you do email marketing, do you do two a week, one a week? What's the frequency recommendation? Depends on your community. Uh, I would recommend one a week unless there's very distinct information that you want to pass along. And it's also just based off your cadence. So I would just follow the open rates uh, on your emails and just make sure that it's not dropping off. Too much email can come out of spam. Too little email, you're not engaging your audience. So there's a, there's a balancing act between the two. Perfect. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And is there, I think Holly has one final question that we'll close out because I know we're at 10.05. Oh, thank you. Hopefully you'll have a quick answer. It's just real basic. You, you said something about um, caption, you know, capturing attention with, it's uh, not Instagram, TikTok versus YouTube. And I'm more interested in YouTube. So what should I focus on for my quick capture attention or so it's it's all about speaking to yeah it's all about speaking to your audience so specifically what, what we talked about before I think the most powerful way for your YouTube channel is having uh, not necessarily just testimonials but conversations with those in uh, uh, those in your community whether it be with the parents or whether it be a lot of education yeah. about like how to identify how to enable uh, being a thought leader in that space I think for for your YouTube channel that would be the most impactful and then having uh, conversations and testimonials from your audience talking about exactly that educational pieces you're passing along. Uh, defeating epilepsy is a great example of a YouTube channel uh, uh, that, that is doing very well uh, on building that kind of thought leadership content and then reinforcing it with like podcast episodes and all these other formats. Oh, that's perfect. I'm running on track. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, thank you, Val and Nikhil uh, from the FreeLogic team and um, bringing really their wide array of, of digital expertise. Um, I mentioned earlier, but uh, they're local, they're based in Riverside, and we've been working with them for quite a while now. And, uh, you know, amongst other uh, growth, they actually just, um, a marker is that we've grown 2,400% since last June with um, all their help. So um, they're really great. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, we hope you kind of enjoyed this open format session and kind of really asking you know, these applicable, these really direct questions about your organizations. We'll send a follow-up email with a recording soon. And yeah, thank you everybody for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank everybody. you everyone. Thank, thank you. Everybody.